Dear Yes Organization Team, dear representatives of the ZBW and the Joachim Herz Stiftung, dear experts, dear comrades in arms and every other person involved, we would like to present our solution for the topic land grabbing or reasonable investments. Our team consists of seven students of the Helene Lange Gymnasium Rendsburg. Obviously, this is our Earth, the planet we are living on. Everything seems to be good, but it isn't. Migration, climate change and global competitions about land, water and raw materials are just a small part of our problem. More and more people inhabit the Earth. Consequently, more and more food is needed to satisfy our hunger. Some nations, often industrial nations, lease or buy cheap land. Oh, well, stop. Some nations, often industrial nations, don't have enough land suitable for their own cultivation. Due to this unfavorable starting position, global players lease or buy cheap land in developing countries. Africa is the most popular destination for such investments. However, African farmers run traditional agriculture using all technology. Both sides are in a sharp conflict with each other. We find an alarming violation of human rights. For example, the right of free speech has already been restricted there. But the settlement of the global players take this problem on threatening dimensions. There's also the fact that, oh. yes. There's also the fact that land registers either exist in the form of paper documents or the register doesn't exist at all. This means that the ownership of land is unclear in many cases. The number of disadvantages does not end. Chiefs who are seen as kings in the villages have the power to make contracts without considering their citizens who don't have the right of co-determination. It has to be said that these chiefs don't see the long-term consequences of their behavior. They are only seeing their advantages and signing the contract even if they don't understand the agreement. The assessment of social, ecological and economic effects is neither sustained nor thorough. Purchase prices are unreasonable because the ground price as well as the current amount of grabbed land are unknown. On this basis, equal information cannot be guaranteed for all parties involved. With the aid of modern machines, the grabbers exploit the land and harm the natural ecological system. As soon as the contract runs out, the land is left without any nutrients. Therefore, the local farmers can't use it anymore, and thus the rural population is poor, hungry, and dissatisfied. Our way of thinking influences global players. If we aren't enlightened, if we don't know anything about the origin of the agricultural products we use every day, if we don't know anything about land grabbing, nothing will change. The extent of land investment has reached huge dimensions. I'd, li I'd like to bring your attention to these charts. On the left you can see that the land which is used by global players <coughs> is as big as approximately 68 billion football fields. Or on the right, 5.3 times the expense of Portugal. It should be emphasized that these figures have to be seen with restrictions.
As you have seen, land grabbing is a very complex topic, including many problems. Therefore, we determined it's not possible to find just one solution. Instead, there was a need of finding more solutions that cooperate with each other. Essentially, our solution includes four pillars, and each pillar refers to one of the main problems. The first problem we want to react to is the lack of awareness. On the one hand, there's the population, the countries of the investors, so all of you. We exert pressure on the investors by choosing which products we are going to buy. And many people don't know anything about land grabbing. That really needs to get changed. On the other hand, there's a local population in the developing countries. The population in the investors' countries should get informed by social media, digital school material about land grabbing, and the spreading of the land matrix, a platform informing about which land is grabbed, by whom, and under which conditions. The population in the developing countries should get informed by school material for the existing schools as well, and by local information centers. Moreover, it's not really clear who owns which lands, so who can decide about it? Therefore, we want to create a land register system which is digital. This digitalization should be, it should be based on the digitalization of existing land register entries. This digitalization could be fulfilled in a cooperation with non-profit NGOs like the Giga Institute for support of the government, which is national. The system offers the opportunity of a clear ownership. Furthermore, the digitalization can be fulfilled in the uh, process of the next pillar. Since we haven't got a transparent market for fair trade, our next step is the creation of a digital, aux <coughs> digital auction platform. <laughs> Landowner can now decide for their own if they want to sell land and how much they want to sell. Prior to that, there's an evaluation of the value of the land that defines the minimum price. So farmer can see now that they don't have to sell the land for so low prices. This task could be fulfilled by NGOs as well and therefore elaborate the existing land matrix. The investors can make bids in the following. The last step is supporting the local rural population for local production. Following the teaching of the investors know-how, an insurance for crop vouchers financed by the government and the support means for investments. For example, new machines for an increase in productivity. All these supports are only guaranteed under the condition that the local farmer produce for the local society. However, it's necessary to say that these solutions can only be achieved if they are based on a stable foundation. This foundation is assembled by the, diff by the, motiv sorry, by the motivation of the different parties and the finances. I will now start with the motivation of the investors. They have the motivation to receive an official seal. Requirement for such a seal is the usage of the auction platform, the transmission of know-how, and the collaboration with the local townsmen, as well as a sustainable cultivation of the land. Companies can insert their seal on their products, the land matrix, and on their CSR report. The motivation of the local population are the actual conditions of property rights and that they can pro produce their own food. Thirdly, the motivation of the state. Within the creation of awareness, they, for instance the chiefs, learn about negative consequences, dissatisfaction, migration, which leads to a lack of power. Besides the sustainable success of the system and the economic rise for the whole region as pointed out to them. Sorry. However, most importantly to say is the opportunity to gather property taxes. Last but not least, the finances. The system is financed by a fund in which money from developing aid flows, as well as the charge of using the auction platform. Furthermore, a part of the property taxes finances the creation of the land register system. But these costs will decrease over time. Finally, 
All these building elements can be put together to form a stable house. A stable solution that turns land grabbing into a fair, efficient and a sustainable process for all parties involved. Thus we will change land grabbing by the land investment revolution, our four pillar solution. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Christine and Lara, for the introduction, for laying down the problem uh, so succinctly and uh, sharing with us your solution. So let's now get the experts on board. Let's now get some of your colleagues up here. Thank you very, very much, and uh, great that you overcome uh, the IT problems at the beginning. But I think that's something that we all share, and I tell you what, I hardly ever see a conference where that doesn't happen, and it's not a question of whether it's students. It happens even to IT people. So um, I'd like to invite uh, to stage two people who just uh, know a hell of a lot about gra land grabbing. They know about it. In in the context of poverty eradication, they know about it in the in the context of having worked for many organisations that uh, intermittently have to do with fighting land grabbing. And um, well, maybe I go for seniority, so I'd like to ask Rolf Langhammer to come up on stage first, the former vice president of the Kiel Institute for World Economy. He's been working for a number of organisations: the EU, World Bank, OECD. He's been working for my favourite ministry, the Ministry for Economic cooperation and I think that's when we met uh, earlier and uh, now second up on stage is Rana Thiele. He also didn't have to come far. He's the head of research area, area poverty reduction, equity and development here from the Kiel Institute for World Economy and he's done a lot of research in that area. So now we need a big round of applause for the experts. We need two important young, young men up here. Tom and Hannes, could you please quickly come up on stage? Young as you are, fast as you are, great, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> now, remember the, uh, yeah, yeah, you can use those. Um, yeah, and up. ideally, you know, yep. I'm, I'm actually fascinated how well they work, but it's quite nice to sort of uh, give those microphones a chance as well. Um, maybe the two defenders come into the middle. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So, so no, no, no acquainting uh, with the enemy here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rolf, maybe yeah. um, we, we kick off with you. Um, yeah. We've heard uh, the issues uh, incredibly well explained. Um, uh, what about the solutions that we've just heard? First of all, it is a terribly important uh, issue, but it is also a terribly difficult issue simply because it is extremely difficult to distinguish between investment and grabbing. Many East Germans would say West Germans grabbed land, though it went under all regular and orderly conditions of land registration and so on and so on. Nevertheless, of course, the feeling is that someone came and grabbed the land in East Germany and these were the West Germans. Now coming to the issue, why is it so important and why is your contribution so important? It is because in a nutshell, it represents all African problems. You have not mentioned specifically Africa, but Connie, you did. And of course it is correct. It is basically an African problem. And in a nutshell, we have all the African problems. The deficiency of institutions, the lack of transparency, um, corruption, and of course, with respect to land, we don't have a clear ownership system. We have community property, we have village community, we have uh, state uh, property and so on. So in this respect, you touched the right points. Though I missed in your presentation what you meant, what I found in uh, the written presentation is the link between international conventions like the Tirana Protocol, you mentioned that, and the way how we could bring that <coughs> protocol, which probably has no teeth, no sanction mechanism, how can we bring it into the local law? How can we induce governments to implement such a protocol into national law. 
That would be very important. We have a number of examples, of course, uh, also in other disciplines where we say a weak government against vested interests in a country, and of course vested interests are landowners in a poor African country, can try to, to get help from linking to international conventions if these conventions have really teeth. That means we can say that, of course, a country would suffer. It would violate such a protocol. And that would be a good idea, of course, and I missed that in your presentation. So the link between the international convention or protocol about orderly uh, land ownership and the way how land is transferred from one order to the other, and the second one, of course, with respect to local law. What I would like to know much more is more details. Who are the guys who buy that land? Are these locals? Or are these foreigners, the Chinese? Many, in many cases, these are locals. And who are the locals? Is it the upper group of people, of course, heads of government, and you know, African countries are usually uh, ruled by old men, and these old men, of course, are extremely rich, number one. Number two is, what about um, your link between agriculture? Agriculture is, of course, either local crops or export crops. Africa is not a very fertile continent. Therefore, your solution goes into order key that Africans should produce their food for themselves and land grabbing is an obstacle to that. I would heavily reject that. Africa is a net importer of food, unlike Asia. It will never be self-sufficient in food. It has to buy food from the rest of the world. And this is, I think, a weakest link in your presentation, is this final point of what you say, smart agriculture, smart or intelligent agriculture. I think this is something you should really reconsider. Thank you. <coughs> Great. Thank you very much. And um, my yeah, yeah, um, okay. the hand signs okay. just meant sort of uh, we're going to have another round as well. So, uh, Rainer, your observations. Yeah, so I will, uh, you more or less painted, Please use a, the microphone. Uh, sorry, painted a broad picture and I try to go a bit, little bit into these four pillars uh, you presented. Uh, so first of all, I think uh, you uh, touched upon the right issues. So it's information, it's transparency, <laughs> it's transparency and it's also, uh, well, um, guaranteeing benefits for the local population of these uh, investments. And so I have one general uh, recommendation or comment. Uh, I wouldn't call the whole process land grabbing from the start because it's so diverse, the phenomenon of these land investments. So uh, it, it sometimes, uh, well, translates into land grabbing, but not in all cases. So you somehow suggest that, that it's uh, generally land grabbing and not, uh, sometimes it can also be a very, well, uh, normal investment. So this is my, my, my general recommendation. And then going into these four pillars. So the first you uh, touched upon is raising awareness in both the developed and in our countries and in the, uh, in the local population. And um, this is a good point, definitely. But I think it falls a little bit short of helping the local population. So uh, in these, uh, when these uh, deals are done, usually the local population is hardly involved. So I think uh, awareness is, is the start, but participation, I think, is uh, something that uh, would help more. So that the local, uh, the, the farm population is somehow involved in the negotiation process when a, a foreign investor comes. So this is my, po uh, my, my remark to the first uh, pillar you had. The second pillar is the, the, this land registry. Uh, this, I think, is a good thing, and uh, it is uh, non-existent in almost all African countries. I think Ethiopia has started a little bit uh, in, in that regard, and the question is how to implement it. So this is really, uh, so admin administrative capacities usually are weak in African countries, so we always talk about Africa now, but I think it's fine. 50, 54 <laughs> different countries yeah, with yeah, uh, yeah. different faces, yeah. but, uh, different uh, surfaces. Still, at, uh, in general, administrative capacities are rather weak so you have to somehow spell out how this uh, digital uh, land registry is to be implemented 
is the donor community to play a, a big role, yes or no? So this is um, my, my comment to the second point. Then the, the third point, the auction platform, which I like very much as a suggestion, but I'm, I, I doubt very much that it can be realized. And the reason is that uh, as it is now, there is a negotiation, negotiation process usually between the government and the investors. And a lot of corruption is involved in that. And I don't know whether governments in Africa, let's say that uh, in that general terms, uh, will be uh, are willing to uh, well, lose that discretionary uh, room of manoeuvring uh, uh, and uh, uh, move on to this very transparent process of uh, um, having an auction platform. So uh, this is something uh, you, you, you have to touch upon, the, well, how realistic this um, uh, suggestion really is. And then the final point is the transmission, yeah, I'm, I'm almost done, the, the transmission of know-how to the local population. I think this is the most important point. So this is uh, how we, we can um, make uh, the, the local population benefit from these uh, investments. And there, again, the question is, yeah, how exactly can we do this? Mm -hmm. So you, you stated in a very general way, which is correct, but uh, I think you need a second step to say, well, uh, do we need a kind of contract farming between these large investments and local smallholders, or what do we need? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I think I'm done. Thank you very much uh, for that first uh, uh, round, uh, Rolf and Reiner. Um, now, um, who's gonna kick off? Um, oh. yeah. yeah, the yeah. microphone that is red. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to do anything. Trust no, our technicians. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to address um, your first point and uh, how do we get interna international regulations, international law? And uh, I think um, this touches the most, uh, the hardest point of uh, the core of the problem because the core of the problem is the motivation and especially the motivation of the country in which the investments have to be done. You already stated that um, the communication is only, mo in most cases, only between the investor and the government of the local state. And the only way I think and we think uh, we can solve this problem is by making it attractive for these nations to uh, do these, uh, to, um, agree to these declarations and uh, to make them national law. And um, the main point uh, that we thought of um, uh, that is, makes uh, something attractive is money. It is also money that uh, makes corruption run in these countries. So um, we thought of, okay, we need these countries to get away to get money from a, the change of the process. And the way a country and the government get, gets money is our taxes. So. The problem is that in many cases, these governments aren't able to get taxes from the land because it is not clear who owns the land. And even if they are international companies, they are from somewhere else, but not from the nation that they can get taxes in. So we need to clarify who owns the land. That is the main point. And with that information, we hope that the nation and the government will be able to get ground taxes and thus to get money and by a legal system and not by corruption. Thank you very much, Tom. Anything that you would like to add at this point? You also made uh, some notes. Uh, yeah, we talked about agriculture and informing uh, the local population. Um, of course, it's uh, not that fertile ground, but the problem is um, if uh, this small amount of fertile ground is uh, yeah, is grabbed by uh, some companies or also local men who export uh, uh, crops and export food, um, there is even less food left for the population. And um, our approach uh, with uh, also informing uh, the local population and uh, bringing the companies uh, to, like you said, a contract would be a good idea, um, to help the local population to um, get uh, into intelligent uh, agriculture, to use more modern technology, because um, the uh, main problem is that the um, uh, that is not very effective in Africa because they you only use traditional uh, agriculture. So we need um, them to have a more effective way of using their small fertile land. 
Having talked to some of uh, African farmers' leaders, uh, of course, uh, they would certainly agree with you <laughs> saying that, the, yes, there needs to be development. However, there is already some application of uh, modern technologies, but not spread enough. So, um, correct. Uh, I would like uh, to... Uh, to ask you uh, whether you would like to have uh, some remarks. Um, there must be uh, one of the uh, squares, uh, one of the cubes must be with you at the moment. There's a third one that's missing. Can you search for it? Oh, great, there it is. Now there's a gentleman over there. Can you sort of do three hops so that he can get involved? Um, one to the back. No, no. Oh, God. Uh, I'm not That's quite sure hop. whether they're built for that, but um, yeah, let's hope for the Thank best. Thank you. Nice toss. Um, Your name, sir? My name is Peter Bick. I'm with Arizona State University in Carbon Nation. The issue of um, agriculture, there are regenerative agriculture techniques that could be used anywhere on the planet that could produce a lot more food than we think possible. So I'm with you on the agricultural piece. Um, what I think is, is an interesting, what I would suggest is to go local and try this not in a country or all 54 countries in Africa or all over the planet, but try it in a county, try it in a small area. And I would bet that the World Bank would give you funding. And I think you could get going straight away. So try it in a small space, develop a working plan, go through all the heartache that that's going to cause and the indigestion. And Seeing that you're an expert, could you just uh, sort of give us a, a country that you might be thinking of? Uh, one or two countries uh, where one could sort of uh, apply that kind of knowledge, where it could be used, where um, the telephone nets, um, are, mobile nets are um, far enough developed Kenya. to... Kenya. 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 Um, and then the last thing is, I think looking at Africa as the place where this is happening isn't the whole picture. I live in Arizona. It's happening in Arizona. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who don't want water rights. So they voted, they live out in the country, they don't want any water regulation. And now countries are buying up land, yeah. growing alfalfa, say the UAE or, or Saudi Arabia, and then shipping that alfalfa to Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. to feed their cows to, to produce dairy products. So Thank you very much for sharing that. It's a virtual that. water yeah. export, and it's happening everywhere around the world. Lovely. Um, anybody else uh, from the audience? Uh, uh, yeah, those are the numbers. I still have uh, a little bit of, we still have a little bit of time. Any questions from you? He wants to get rid of that cube? No. Yep. Um, I, I'd like to ask um, our, our two experts. I mean, first of all, the contention is happening all around the world. Um, and I think uh, we talked about the GIZ problem about uh, Cambodia, um, where even uh, at a certain limited amount of space, people were already settled in a certain environment. Um, and it took a lot of time and effort and a lot of help to actually put down the rights of who owns what. Um, is there a, um, a simple digital solution to that? The short answer, uh, yeah. the short answer is no. And the, uh, uh, the long answer is? The long is answer is uh, land rights, in, in particular in Africa, are very complex. So they are, some land is owned privately by farmers and they have titles, but this is a, a small minority. And then there are different forms of communal land and uh, different use rights. So this would all have to be spelled out before such a land re registry could make sense. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a very complex process. It's compared to Arizona or uh, the former uh, <laughs> East Germany, it's, it's, it's completely different and, and much more complex. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, Rolf, any shortcuts that, um, uh, where you can see where the solutions that we've heard could be applied? I mean, let's sort of, you know, turn the table and look at it from a positive point of view. The, posi <coughs> the positive point of view is to look at the tech space. I think there are some improvements. I speed up a little bit. The tech space in Africa is usually very small and very weak. Tax administration weak, tax space small. Nobody pays direct taxes. You can't tax income in Africa. It's very difficult. But what you can do, you can track, uh, tax transactions. <coughs> so to trans if you have a transaction, then you can tax that. And what you can even do is you can tax the revenues, the incremental revenues, 
we call it that in Germany, Bodenwertzuwachssteuer. It's a tax. It's, a, it's an awful, yeah, it's an awful. You know, we, we increment in gains in the asset of land that can be taxed. And that is also then available as a, as a, as a process. The problem is, again, you have corruption, you have vested interests, and you have people, of course, who have much power to prevent that. And this is why I stick to the international convention. That is a really po big point, and you should try to work on it. And you can also link the Tirana Protocol, maybe to money, to conditional aid, and so on and so on. But then you have to convince the donors. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, I see a little bit of, or I hear a little bit of mumbling. I'm not quite sure whether mumbling is connected to what we're discussing here. So could you just sort of, you know, throw the um, cube forward and please not too far and uh, just grab the cube, not the land. <laughs> well, trying to avoid it is difficult. I think that's what's called passing the buck or passing the cube. What Any questions? Even if, uh, yeah, I'm looking at you, the uh, gentleman with the striped shirt. Um, any questions? You've been listening. Um, you, you must have questions. Because it's it's, it's it's rather difficult issue, so I, I don't think it's an issue that's not really lend itself, lending itself for a 10 minute explanation. Um, was everything perfect? Was everything clear? I, I think everything was perfect, but to be okay. honest, I don't have a question. But I in that case, just to the other side, there's a lady in the second row and the gentleman who was just on stage before. Okay, um, so to be honest, I don't, I don't know a lot about land grabbing and all this stuff. Um, the only thing that I know is that there already are a lot of efforts to help developing countries. So um, just my question that I have is, um, in which way is your ID different from what is already there? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, would you mind passing uh, the cube to the, yeah, great. Okay. Um, I do have a very, very simple question about information I do not know and I would like to know. You talked about um, uh, transparency by digitalizing uh, the, the contracts over ownership. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether or not the African countries are actually digital enough to, to do such a thing. Is there a digital infrastructure in, in Africa? I don't, do not know. I would, I'm really well, there's certainly a mobile infrastructure, um, uh, so I, I, I think uh, if you feel happy to answer that, please do. So straight up answer to you. Um, we talked about the land matrix that's um, uh, yeah, engaged by uh, the Giga Institute and um, in the land matrix um, just uh, tries to create the transparency in that. That is not made by, Afri uh, by some African institutes, but um, some people try to get uh, these contracts and try to digitalize them to make information more clear. Um, also a big problem of land grabbing is that we don't really know how much land is grabbed and what is a reasonable investment. So we have to make, of course, like it was said, we have to um, have a look on that, what is grabbed and what is, uh, where it is invested. So um, we very much have a problem of information, of course. So that's also a point why land grabbing is a very hard uh, topic to tackle. But I think you meant, or mainly meant, the ownership deeds, and uh, yeah, and uh, the digital infrastructure, um, as Mr. Langhammer already said, um, is building up, and it is definitely, most definitely, not perfect. Um, but um, they have some kinds of computers, so they are not that far back uh, than you might think. And uh, maybe there is no Windows 10 on them, uh, but uh, I think um, they should be enough to handle some text data and maybe some uh, picture data. And uh, we hope um, with, uh, that it won't be more. They're just digitalizing. And the main point of that is uh, that you uh, can easily find these registers. So that somebody um, in a, uh, 100 kilometers away in a different uh, government office will be able to see, okay, at there, that and that uh, coordinates, um, there is land that was bought by whom and who owns it. 
and just that communication also get easy, gets easier between the government offices. Uh, I'd like to invite Rolf to comment. Um, as far as you know, how uh, big, how extended is the digital base? How much could we apply <coughs> technologies that is being used here? The digital base is um, developing rapidly with respect to um, telecom information. It is still very weak with respect to knowledge on land property. Uh, but I don't think this is really the big problem. The big problem in Africa is always enforcement um, and uh, coping with vested interests. And if, if you have state land, of course, and here the information, of course, is available, state land. Of course, who benefits from that state land and who, of course, is able to transfer such a strategic resource? African countries, like minerals, of course, look upon land as a strategic resource, and that resource is only, of course, given to the clientele, which, of course, are supporting the government. One should be really clear about that. Rainer, um, you, you mentioned one thing which I would like to ask you about. Um, uh, maybe you can sort of help and assist to find the or define the difference between land grabbing, which is to be shunned, uh, try to be avoided. On the other hand, um, resources properly invested in a country, in a region, where both sides profit, the external investor and also the local people. Have you actually seen those projects? I have seen a few showcase projects in Zambia. So we have a Zambian colleague in, in our department and she has worked on, on, on Zambian land investments for quite some time. And there it was really a, a joint effort by the Zambian government by uh, local chiefs, and they also involve, to a certain extent, the local population, but only to a certain extent. They are the weakness of the, of the project in Zambia lie, that the local population is still not really participating in the process. But the, the local chiefs, and if they act on behalf of the po population, then it's, it's already a first step. And there, there were some investments where um, the, uh, the investors uh, agreed to uh, engage in contract farming, so uh, which means that they, for example, help uh, local smallholders buy fertilizer and uh, get access to credit and all what they, what they uh, did not have before. So this is a, a kind of, uh, at least, uh, I would call this kind of uh, activity investment rather than land grabbing. Mm. Thank you. Um, the cube is still with you. I, I think it's with you. Any, uh, you, you should do your comment. Any, anybody else um, with questions? Uh, Connie, excuse me. Um, we had sorry. one question there, and yeah. from the young man uh, from uh, Thank the you very US. Much. You can be my co-moderator. I'm not. I can go. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so first, to answer your question, um, or maybe to comment on your suggestion. Um, Thinking about the World Bank was actually, is actually a really good thing. Um, um, yeah, and uh, because we need money, of course, because it's very costly to uh, implement some kind of register system. Um, and also about uh, like grabbing water, it's a big problem. Also, um, so we only uh, not only, but we addressed um, mainly the agricultural problem. But uh, grabbing water resources is also a big problem, like you said, that also has to be addressed. Thank you very much. The lady in the second row, um, and then um, where did you I see the other person? That were the only two ones. Okay, uh, fine. fine. <laughs> um, so you asked what would be the difference between the approaches other organizations had made in Africa, and uh, the answer to that is that these approaches um, aim uh, are really monolistic. Um, so they focus on one point, and they try to make this point happen to uh, help the local farmers with uh, farming uh, for their mainly unfertile land, uh, or it's really one point. The problem is um, that the problem in the, uh, with land grabbing isn't that monolistic. It is more dy dimensional. And uh, with a solution, you have to respect all these different dimensions. And this is why we uh, have gone for these four pillars. Because we said, okay, it is impossible to solve land grabbing by only one single solution. We need many different ones that address many different problems that form one big problem, the land grabbing itself. 
You know, we're all sort of living in the uh, age of global goals, 2030. Um, the world community has decided that each and every country is doing their contribution, A, inside, and also assisting others uh, in getting 17 issues uh, uh, better than they are today. Um, would you see your project linked to any one of these uh, 17 goals? Quality of land? Did did you when when you looked uh, when you worked at the project did you did you have that in mind or did you, were you just sort of looking at certain issues that you knew? Um, maybe to approach it that way. Um, the problem is that there are also not that much, um, yeah, like uh, restriction or like um, uh, w there, are, like on land grabbing. Um, no, um, the Tirana Declaration is the only thing that really addresses land grabbing itself as a problem. Um, and their land grabbing, uh, there's, there's the only official uh, definition of land grabbing. So um, the problem also is that land grabbing is not uh, addressed at, as much as it should be in, uh, yeah, on a global basis because it is a global problem. It's not only Africa, it's also um, it's somewhere in Asia and so on, um, and also th South America. So um, it has to be more touched in, uh, on a global basis. And also um, it has to get, uh, get a, a floor at the UN maybe or so, because um, like that we need a global solution and everybody has to help there. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so to refer to your question, um, we think that none of these 70 points directly refers to land grabbing. And uh, that is the point. It is not in, the, uh, in our mind right now. Uh, in the Western mind, at the mind of U the UN, it's missing and it has to be addressed. And that needs to be changed. Thank you very much. Um, uh, looking at development uh, policy now for me for the last 30 years, for you probably um, um, even two years longer, um, all I can say is that from time to time there seems to actually be a fashion, like land grabbing was fashionable as a topic uh, five, six years ago. Then uh, the discussion about the new global goals came along, sustainability and everything else. And now everything seems to be sort of overlaid uh, by the issue of migration. Just, and this has got nothing to do with your project, tell us all, why should we care? Why did you care? Why should you care? Um, you should care because in the end, uh, you are all um, the guilty ones. And this is hard, but you all are consumers and you all buy chocolate, you all buy products from Africa, from Grab Land, and in the end, the process and the land grabbing is only happening because you buy these products. And so, I think it is our responsibility and our power to change that. I've already had the five minutes, uh, uh, probably three minutes ago. So, very short remark, um, something positive, very short remark from you, and then it's their last word. Exactly the point, Tom. Um, <laughs> Land degradation is a serious problem in Africa and due to the enormous population pressure, of course the population is clustered along the very few fertile regions, the Rift Valley, Rwanda, it's, it's, it's not a surprise that the troubles are there. And if we want of course to see that people live on their, from their land, not only from agriculture but using land of course maybe for tourism or something like that, of course we need clear rights of entitlements and property rights for land. That is otherwise, of course, it will be a mess. And then, of course, we will suffer, of course, too. Because if people leave the land, land will further degradation, of course. You have to stay in the land, otherwise it's lost, and people will come to us. And the land is still there. So that is, I think, you have an excellent point, yes. And it is our own interest, very selfish interest, that the land rights are clear and the land degradation stops. Thank you very much, uh, Rolf. Maybe sort of something positive. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um. Yeah, so I don't know whether I have something sorry, positive, but I, I, I briefly respond to uh, what you think, uh, why we should care. And uh, so you uh, argued with our guilt, and I, as a development uh, expert, I would argue with uh, the, the 
poverty reduction. So it, it's really uh, these, these land investments, they affect the poor, some of the poorest people in the world, at least in Africa. And uh, so it, it is very important uh, to, to raise productivity of these small scale uh, farmers. And the question is, can these uh, land investments or land grabbings contribute to that? Or are they even detrimental to it? And I, my, uh, uh, on balance, my idea is that they could contribute to poverty reduction to SDG 1 and SDG 2 uh, if they were uh, implemented properly. So they are not only uh, evil Chinese investors, and uh, so that is my positive note. Great. Um, and I've been pointing at me, hoping that the guys would get the gist that I'm a woman. Um, and of course, it's also a gender question. I'm quite sure that you uh, talked about that because the ones that do certainly not have titles to the land because it was owned by the fathers or by the brothers, but they're working on it, are a lot of the women. And again, in Rwanda, that might be another place for you to start. Um, that is uh, already a place where IT is uh, quite well in place and where a lot of women are still waiting for for their right uh, to the uh, floor, the, to the soil that they toil on. One last word from you. I could go on and on and on, but everybody would be completely bored out of their minds. So, why should everybody vote for you tomorrow? As I already said, um, we are all consumers and we are all responsible for that. And it's, it's our task for the next years to stop something like land grabbing from happening. We have to stop it because the people will come to us. We will have the migration problem, and then we will have the problem with the populism and anything else that follows it. So it is really the core of a huge problem that we all face and will face for the next years. And you can change that. We can change that by rising awareness. We can change that by informing the local uh, people, we, by educating them. We can change that by creating a transparent market where competition ensures fair price for the land. And we can ensure that by, uh, by creating clear land ownership rights. And if you want to help us, then you vote, uh, vote uh, for our solution and then we will hopefully have solved that problem in the next years, in the next 20 years, 30 years, because it's a long process and it's only a small start that we are doing. Thank you so much. Great applause. Don't run away. Don't run away. Stay there. You, you know, I always do stupid things and I know uh, it's lunch break in a second, but please just give me one more minute. Would you young ladies stand up, please? And everybody, yes, please. And everybody in your row and everybody to the front. Just, just follow, don't worry, you don't have to dance, you don't have to do anything bad. Um, and maybe half of the row behind. So the gentleman with a beard and half of that row, please. Just, just get up, just get up, just uh, very quickly. It's, it's nothing bad involved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at numbers. Right at the moment, the world population, about a seventh of us are starving or are so badly fed that malnutrition will kill people and adults. Now, they are the symbol of that one seventh. And you know what? Ideally, in a couple of years' time, when some of that and some of other solutions have been done, you can sit down and we can actually feed everybody. We just need the right policies. So thank you very much for your contribution.